I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. I'd like to also thank Brother Corbin or Deacon Russell for the opportunity to preach. So we're here in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, and look at verse 8 where the Bible reads, And then shall that wicked, want, and then shall that wicked, wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they, may, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the love Sorry, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And the top of my sermon comes from verse 11, where it says, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And the top of my sermon today is uh, called being delusional, being delusional. Now, what does the word delusion mean? So the word delusion means this. It says, a delusion is an unshakable belief in something untrue. These irrational beliefs defy normal reasoning and remain firm even when overwhelming proof is presented to dispute them. And then someone who's delusional is someone having false or unrealistic beliefs or opinions. And then in psychiatry, it means this. It says, maintaining fixed false beliefs even when confronted with facts, usually as a result of mental illness. Now, we see here in the Bible that God in the end times is gonna send people a strong delusion and that they're gonna believe a lie. And I think the Bible there has a definition of delusion where it's people believing something that's not true. And whenever someone presents facts to someone and these facts are clear and you can understand them, but then you end up not rejecting these facts, then at that point, you're delusional. And you probably have heard people say that uh, in your life where someone says, you, you show them a bunch of information, you show them proofs of things, but then you say, then they just don't believe it. And it gets to the point you get frustrated with that person. You're, you're just like, you're delusional, man. So that's the essence of that is that you give someone a bunch of facts. They don't believe the facts. At that point, you're like, <laughs> I don't know what to do with you. Well, even uh, go with me to what we'll do is we're, I'm just going to go over a few quick points about things that people believe that I would say are delusional. And I want you to go with me to Luke chapter number 18, Luke chapter number 18. Now, why I came up with this sermon, what made me think about this sermon, I was out soul winning. And over the past few weeks, for some reason, people have been giving, you hear this answer a lot, but it was just more so because I think it was just door after door after door. People were saying this and, you know, you go out, you knock a door, you ask someone if they're 100 percent sure they're going to heaven. The person says yes. And then you ask them, how do you know for sure? What do you believe it takes to get to heaven? And then they'll say, well, it's because I'm a good person and because I follow the good, the golden rule. And I remember someone gave us that answer at a door. So after we walked away, the person didn't really want to listen to the gospel. So when we walked away, I told my soul winning partner, I was like, this person's delusional. Because for someone to believe that you, you're, you have to be a good person to get to heaven, you have to just negate a bunch, so many facts. So I said at that point, that person's just being delusional. And that's what my first point is today, is that people who believe that they are good enough to go to heaven, they are delusional. Now, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And it says this, And that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So for someone to be saved, you have to acknowledge that you're a sinner so you can understand the need of a Savior. But to many people, Jesus to them is like an afterthought. That's why they can say they're a Christian in one you know, breath and then say, well, I have to be a good person to get to heaven. And they don't even mention Jesus in that same breath. So the thing is, is that we already know, and I know most of the people here know that you don't have to be a good person to get to heaven. The thing that you have to do to get to heaven is just simply put your faith in Christ. But like I said, there are a lot of people out there who think that, well, if I'm a good enough person, I'm going to get there. And I will say that that person's delusional, especially if you get the opportunity to give them the whole gospel and then that person still rejects it. That's happened to me many times where I've given someone the whole gospel. They say, oh, I have to be a good person in the beginning. I give them the whole gospel. And at the end, they still say the same thing. They say, well, I still believe you have to be a good person. So at that point, 
that's when you just throw up your hands and you don't tell them in their face, but you say, man, this person is delusional. Now, why do they have this thought? Well, I think one reason they have this thought is because what they're doing is they're comparing themselves to other people. So they're thinking that, well, if I'm not an axe-wielding maniac that's going around killing people, then I'm a good enough person. Or if I give someone a gift for Christmas, well, then I'm following the golden rule. I'm, being, I'm doing good onto someone else. Well, the thing is, the Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 10, 12. It says, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with that with, uh, with some that commend themselves, but they that measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So people are going around just comparing themselves to other people, and usually it's a pride thing where they're trying to lift themselves up to say, hey, I'm better than such and such. Then they're not wise according to the Bible. And like I said, a lot of people, I think that's why a lot of people who have this idea, well, I'm a good person, it's just that they're comparing themselves to people that are obviously worse than them. Or the other thing is, is that they have the bar of sin so low that they just think, well, I'm not committing adultery, so therefore I'm a good person. Or I'm not, I haven't killed anyone yet, so therefore I'm a good person. But that's not true. You know, you have other sins in your life that make you not a good person. So that's why you need to put your trust and faith in Christ. Now, I had you go to Luke chapter number 18, Luke 18, and look at verse 9, because Jesus talks about these people in the Bible. And it says in Luke 18, 9, it says, And he spake this parable unto certain, and look at this, it says, Which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. That's the same people we talk to here in 2020 that say, Oh, I'm a good person when you ask them to say, you know, for sure they're going to heaven. Because what is that person ultimately doing? They're trusting in themselves that they're righteous, and then they're looking down on others saying, well, other people are not good, as good as I am. And the Bible, or Jesus gives a parable of an example of people who are like this. It says in uh, verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and look at this, it says, or even as this publican. So what is this guy doing? He's praying with himself. He's praying, saying, God, I thank thee that I'm not an extortioner, I'm not an adult, or unjust, I'm not an adulterer. And then what does he do in the end? He compares himself to the publican, saying, I'm not as this publican over here. And he says, I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. So this guy is bragging about all the stuff he, he does, in our modern vernacular, we'll say this guy thinks that he's a good person. He thinks that he's a righteous person because of all the things he's doing. And then on top of that, he's prideful and boasting and comparing himself to someone else that may not be in the same situation as him, where they're not an extortion, they're not unjust, they're not an adulterer. And he's boasting about these things, but we know from this story that, or this parable, that he's not the person who's in the right in this, in, in this chapter. Now, in verse 13, it says this. It says, And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So we see the difference or the contrast with the publican. The publican, he was humble. He exercised humility. He said the first thing that came out of his mouth was, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So we can see that that's how a Christian should be, is that they should have a humble attitude. And you notice the people that say a lot of the time when you say, hey, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? The ones who say, well, I don't really know, are a lot of the time the people who want to listen. Or a person who says, well, you know, I've done a lot, a lot of bad stuff in my life. I don't know if I'm good enough. And then you're, it's easier for you to show them how to get to heaven compared to someone who says, well, I'm a good person. You already there, There's already like a rough start when you're trying to present to someone like that. Now, obviously, those people can get saved if they, they're humble enough to listen to what the Bible says. But oftentimes, they're, they're not. That's the sad thing about it. Now, go with me to, or actually, let's look at verse 14. It says, and I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. It's talking about the publican rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So, Again, you see a person who is humble is going to be exalted in God's sight, and the person who exalts himself, that's praising himself, looking all the good things that they're doing, saying that I'm a good person, well, that person's going to be a base. What does it mean to be a base? They're going to be brought down low. So sometimes when people tell me they're a good person, and just, I don't do this often, but, you know, I'll just say, how good do you have to be? 
in order to be 100% sure you're going to heaven. A lot of the time, then the person like thinks about it and they're like, yeah, you made a good point there. And then sometimes they're willing to listen. I'm not saying that happens all the time, but that's at least a good enough point to say, yeah, well, I don't know how good a person, I, I, you know, I, I don't know how good I would have to be to be 100% sure, because you don't have to be good to get to heaven. The thing you have to do to, to get to heaven is that you have to put your faith in Christ. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, go with me to Matthew chapter number 19, Matthew 19. And when you get there, look at verse 16, Matthew 19, 16, Matthew 19, 16. And it says this, and behold, one came and said unto him, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And this is the story, the familiar story of the rich young ruler. He comes up to Jesus and he says, what good thing that I should I do that I may have eternal life? And it says this in verse 17, and he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. So we even see here that Jesus is saying that no one on this earth is good except for God. And Jesus is God, so therefore he's saying that he's good. So you can tell that to a Jehovah's Witness to confuse them because they don't think that Jesus is God. So then you ask, is Jesus good? And they say yes. Then he was God. That simple pastor brought that up, and I think it's a really good thing. I've done it to him before, and it really does confound them. And it says this, but if Thou will enter into life, keep the commandments. So I think Jesus is trying to help this guy understand he's not as good as he is. And that's why I'm saying, if you're going to enter into life, keep the commandments. And then it says this, and he saith unto him, which? So he's asking, yeah, which commandments should I keep? Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, all the stuff that your <laughs> unsaved person says at the door that, you know, when you're going out soul winning. Well, it says this in verse 20. The young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I? So what, what lack I yet? So this guy is saying that, hey, I've done all these things you just said. You know, I haven't committed adultery. I haven't stolen. I haven't, you know, I haven't bore fault with false witness. I haven't lied. I haven't, you know, I've honored my father and my mother. Now, I believe this guy is lying. I think he's just really full of himself. And I think Jesus proves this in verse 21 because it says, Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. So Jesus was like, you know what? I'm going to get this guy and I guess he may have uh, known that he was rich. So he says, hey, go sell everything you have. You know what? I'll bless you in heaven. God's going to bless you in heaven. And I, I don't believe this guy was saved, but he's saying, you know, if you sell all the stuff you have on this earth, you'll be blessed in heaven and then come and follow me. But look at verse 22. It says this. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So Jesus helped this guy that thinks he's a good person, that thinks he's keeping all God's commandments. You know, that's pretty much delusional. He's helped him to understand that, hey, I'm not actually that perfect. I'm not as great as I think I am. And that's what we should do out soul winning. You know, just like I said earlier, you know, I'll often ask, oftentimes ask people, you know, how good do you have to be? before you can know for sure. And then that's a good enough head scratcher for the person to say, you know what? I don't know how good enough I have to be to get to heaven. Therefore, you know, you can show me how to get to heaven. It's, you know, it's that simple. So verse 23, it says this, then said Jesus unto his disciples, verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So, we see here that Jesus is just saying that it's hard for rich people to get into heaven because a lot of these people end up trusting in their riches instead of trusting in Christ to get, to get them there. Now go with me to Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter number 5. While you're turning there, I'm going to read a few familiar passages out. In Matthew 7 verse 21, it says this, Jesus says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils in thy name, done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And we can even see from this passage that people, there are going to be people in the last days that say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, in thy name cast out devils, in thy name done many wonderful works? We obviously know these people are trusting in their works to get to heaven, but Jesus is telling them that, 
uh, he's got to profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So he's just proving that someone who thinks that they're a good person, someone who's just trying to justify themselves through their works, it doesn't impress God. And if they're trusting that to get into heaven, that person goes straight to hell. Now, not only that, and why had you turn to Galatians 5 is this, is that if someone, old, you know, believes that you have to be a good person to get to heaven, then that person is pretty much saying that they're, they have to keep the whole law. Because ultimately, if you're saying that I'm a good person, and we usually use when we're talking to these people, they quote unquote say they're Christians. Well, you get what's right and wrong from God's law. That's how you understand the right and wrong in our lives. I mean, our society tells us what's right and wrong, but ultimately God is what's the true things that are right and wrong. You know, not using a, a, a you know, not cutting your lawn. It's not really that. I don't believe that's a sin. We should just keep all ordinance of man to do what's right and live peaceably. But it's not in God's law. It doesn't say thou shalt not cut your gra- or thou shalt cut thy grass, you know. But so that's one type of law. But the laws that in order for, you know, the, the laws that we should be keeping are God's laws. And if for, for us to understand right and wrong, it's going to come from God's law. Paul says this in Romans 7. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So Paul is even saying that he, without the law, he wouldn't know sin. And I think that's how it is a lot of the time with most people. You're not going to know, you, don't, you won't know the full grasp of what's right and wrong until you actually read the whole Bible. Or if you're in a good church where they're actually preaching the whole counsel of God. I mean, before I got saved, I, there was a lot of things I didn't know were wrong. And then once I heard it preached, and once I read in the Bible, I found out they were wrong. I was like, okay, well, I need to get this thing out of my life. I need to get that thing out of my life. And you learn that stuff from the Bible. But a lot of these people who say that they're a good person, they don't, a lot of the time, they don't even read their Bible to know that. But even if someone is saying this, that, oh, well, I have to be a good person to get to heaven, then what they're ultimately saying is that I have to keep the law in order to get there. That's, that's the grand scheme of things. If they just want to put it in layman's terms, that they have to keep the law. Well, the problem with that is this, is that people who say that you have to keep the law in order to get to heaven, they're under a curse. And that curse is that you have to keep the whole law. The Bible says, and that's why I had you turn to Galatians 5, and look at verse 2. Paul says this, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. And in the church of uh, Galatia, what was going on is that they had a lot of infiltrators come in and they started preaching that you had to be circumcised and believe in Christ to get to heaven. And Paul's pretty much doing damage control and he's saying that a lot of these people, you know, he's questioning some of them if they're even saved because they're saying a lot of weird things. And he even says, I'm afraid of you, just because he's surprised that they're believing a lot of this garbage that these Judaizers came in to tell them. Well, it says this in verse 3, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. So Paul says this, that if I testify that Every man that is circumcised, so if someone's trusting in their circumcision to get, get to heaven, then Paul's saying that you're a debtor to do the whole law. You have to do the whole law if you think that, well, this, you know, I have to be a good person to get to heaven. Well, if you really want to get to heaven, then you need to keep the whole law. You're a debtor to do everything in that. Now, go over to Galatians chapter number 3, because this is explained more in Galatians 3. And when you get there, look at verse 8. Galatians 3, 8, the Bible reads and says, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And it says in verse 10, For as many as are, for as many as are of the works of the law, are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So people who say that, oh, well, I'm getting to heaven because I'm a good person, or because I go to church, because I'm keeping God's commandments, well, they have to continue in all of God's law in order to get there, And you, meaning that you would have to be perfect to get to heaven. But the thing is, none of us are perfect. None of us are good enough to get to heaven. So if someone's saying, well, I'm a good person, and if I have to get to heaven, then 
you know, I'm, I have to do good things. Well, they have to do everything that the Bible says that you need to do in order to get there, meaning you have to keep the whole, every commandment in the Bible. But the thing is, none of us can do that. So that's what I'm saying. If someone believes that, they're just being delusional. Obviously, either they've never read the Bible or they just haven't thought about what they're saying or they're just, and most of the time, I mean, 99.9999% of the time, they're just not saved. So the natural man's not going to receive the spiritual things of the Bible. So that's why they're saying things that just don't make any sense. Now, it says in verse 11, because if they read just one, if they read Galatians and read one verse after verse 10, it says, but that no man is justified by the law on the side of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So the Bible is clear that Christ has redeemed us from that curse of having to continue in all the things that are written in the law. Now, I believe people in the Old Testament and the New Testament are all saved the same way by faith in Christ. Uh, the people in the Old Testament were looking forward to Jesus' coming. Obviously, I didn't really know his name in that sense of that, it, you know, it was Jesus or whatever, but they knew that there was a coming Messiah that was going to save everyone from their sins. And then we look back to all the stuff Jesus did for us, for us to get to heaven. That name's revealed, that that name's Jesus, and that's who we have to trust in now in order to get to heaven. Well, the Bible's saying that Christ has redeemed us from the law, being made a curse for us, for his written curse is everyone that hangeth on the tree. And it's talking about Jesus Christ dying on the cross for all of our sins. He was, you know, and that's why they took him down. Because in the Old Testament law, they said you can't, if you hang someone, they can't be hung overnight or some, something along those lines. And that's why they ended up taking him down. And they said if someone is hung on a cross, then they have this curse on them. Read the book of, like, Deuteronomy and Leviticus and all that stuff to get more details. But just saying that is that. Christ has made that curse, so we don't have to have that curse of keeping everything in the law. That's why a person who puts their faith in Christ, this doesn't apply to them because they say, hey, I'm not trusting in the law to get myself into heaven. I'm trusting in Christ alone. Now, Galatians, look down at verse 21. I think this is a good, good place to finish off with this point. It says in Galatians 3.21, I may have said Galatians 21, but Galatians 3.21, it says this, is the law then against the promises of God, God forbid, for if there which... For if there had been a law which, which, ah, sorry, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified. By faith. Why do we look to the law? Well, the law is there to correct us and help us understand that we're sinners, and then that in the in the end, it's going to help bring us onto Christ, so that what? So that we could be justified by faith in God's sight. We could put our faith in Christ, and then we can get to heaven that way. So now, what I want you to do, we're going to switch same type of point, but we're going to go. I'm going to have you turn to Romans chapter number five. Romans chapter number five. Now. My first point was this, is that people who believe that you have to be a good person in order to get to heaven, they're delusional. Why is that? Because there's mountains of evidence in the Bible that proves that none of us are good enough to get into heaven. All of us are sinners. And if someone thinks that, then they're just plainly not saved. And they're delusional if they think that, well, all my good, you know, I'm a, I'm a good person. Because, like, if you're such a good person, then why are you even a Christian? Because, you know, the reason why we're Christians is because we believe Jesus died for our sins. So if you don't believe Jesus died for, or if you believe you're such a good person, then it just, you know, see, it, it doesn't even make sense. I feel like my head's going to explode just trying to understand these people. But it, it doesn't make sense because the person is just clearly delusional. People who are saved understand that, hey, our works don't get us into heaven. We don't have to be good to get to heaven because there's no way any of us can be perfect because that's the only way you'll get to heaven is by being perfect. But another thing is because there are people out there, on the contrary, who think they've never sinned, and I believe those people are delusional. So my second point is this, is people who think that they don't sin or they've never sinned are delusional. Same thing when you're out soul winning. Say someone gives you the opportunity to give them the gospel. Then what you'll often hear people, and if i got to raise a hand, I'll probably anyone who's went soul winning for a length of time will say, yeah, I've run into someone like this, where you say, hey, are you, uh, you start giving them the gospel, and then you ask them, are you a sinner? 
or you, you go, take them to Revelation 21.8, and then you, you give the list of all the people going to hell, and then you ask them, you say, hey, are, have you ever lied before? And then that person says no. And then you're like, what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're just like, that makes no sense. Like, everyone's lied, but they're, they, they have the boldness to tell you that they've never lied before. And it's ridiculous, but oftentimes when people tell you that, they're lying, and they're just, they're just not, you know, they're just being... They're being foolish, and the Bible says the thought of foolishness is, a, is sin. So, But you'll hear that, or I've heard it where I remember trying to preach to someone, and this guy told me he completely had no sin. I don't know if any of you guys have run into someone like that, where they literally say, I have no sin. It's not even that they say that I've never sinned before, but I think they may have acknowledged that they sinned in the past, but now they're quote-unquote saved, and now they say, I have no sin whatsoever. Well, those people are delusional, too. Every single one of us are sinners. So there's even after we get saved, that doesn't mean that we don't sin anymore. And I'm going to prove that from the Bible. But just as a, uh, um, I guess a few verses to, to give out is this. It says in 1 Kings, this is in the Old Testament, Solomon speaking. It says this in 1 Kings 8, 46. And you don't have to turn here. It says, if they sin against thee, for there is not, sorry, sorry for there is no man that sinneth not. So, Solomon, even in his time, is saying that he said, now it's in quotes, and he says, for there is no man that sinneth not. So Solomon's saying, in his day and age, there's no person that sins. And I believe it's, the, you know, it's more or less the narrator of the Bible saying that, for that there is no man that sinneth not, meaning everyone sins. There's not one person on this earth that doesn't sin. And then to even prove that further, Ecclesiastes 7.20, you'll hear this verse a lot where it says, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. So the Bible's even saying that there's not a just person on this earth, meaning that there's not someone that's just this perfect, righteous person. The only person who was like that was Jesus Christ that's on this earth that does good and doesn't sin. You know, every single one of us has done things like that. You know, has done some form of sin, whether it's lying, whether it's stealing, whether it's so on and so forth. And sometimes when people ask me this out soul winning, and one of my friends, he did a nice little trick on them. It's not a trick because it, it, it made sense how he said it, and it kind of confounded them. We'll just put it like this. But just to be nice, whenever I talk to people and they say, well, you know, I'm giving them the gospel, they say they never sin, I'll just say, has your, have your, especially if they're slightly older, and usually it's like, you know, a teenager or above or a, a preteen or above, you'll just say, well, I, I'll usually just say, has your par- have your parents ever disciplined you? And most of the time, they're going to say yes. I was like, well, have your parents disciplined? If your parents are disciplining you, then that means you had to do something wrong to get disciplined. So therefore, you've had to sin because the Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother. So I'll say that, and usually, especially like younger kids or like I said, preteens or something like that, they'll understand that and they'll say, yeah, okay, I've done wrong. And usually I can continue with the gospel with them on that. But you'll still have people who just completely deny things like that. They'll deny reality and say, no, I've never sinned. No, I've never done anything. So my friend said this, and I thought this was good because I was out soul with him one time, and he says, someone kept telling him that, that, you know, that they're not a sinner. So he said, do you know why Jesus died for you? And then the guy was just like, he died for my sins. And he was just like, there you go. He's like, that because, that's because you're a sinner. So I got him on that, and I think the guy ended up, I can't remember if he got saved or not, but he ended up preaching to him. That's one good thing. So that's one thing you can try to do sometimes if you run into a person like that. You just say, hey, do you know why Jesus died for you? And if they say, if they're at least, they have some semblance of like (laughs) decency, they'll say, yes, Jesus died for me. You know, he died for my sins. If not, then you probably just need to go to the next door. Now the Bible says this, and this is where People who are quote-unquote saved, which, you know, I don't believe these people are saved that believe in sinless perfection. They'll go to a verse in 1 John, and like I said, you don't have to turn there. This is all uh, more or less introduction to this point. But it says in 1 John 3, 9, it says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. So you'll hear people say, well, after I got saved, I've reached a state of sinless perfection. So, like... I know Pastor Anderson was on some uh, show with some guy, and the guy was pretty much saying, the guy, I'll just call him Mr. Amazing, because <laughs> everything he always said was amazing. So Mr. Amazing was saying that he never sinned before. And 
pastors just like calling the guy out saying, yes, you have, we're all sinners and so on and so forth. And I'm not saying this guy is using this verse, but I've heard people try to use this verse that says, whosoever is bar born of God doth not commit sin for a seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he's born of God. So he's like, if you're born of God, then you're no longer going to sin. Well, that's not true either. And just to explain that is this, is that when a person gets saved, you have two people living inside of you. There's the old man and the new man. The old man wants to sin. The old man wants to do what's wrong. The old man isn't subject onto the laws of God. But then you have the new man. The new man wants to do what's right. The new man is subject onto the laws of God. And these, the, you know, those, and don't sit there and go to the doctor's office and say, hey, I <laughs> Brother Caleb told me that there's two guys living inside of me <laughs> and I need to get an x-ray because that's, it's a spiritual thing, not a physical thing. <laughs> but anyway, so you have these guys just warring inside of you and one wants to do what's right, one wants to do what's wrong. And that's what it's talking about where it says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for a, se sin uh, for a seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. That's the new man. The new man can't sin. The new man can't do wrong. The new man's not going to do anything wrong. The new man is perfect, but we still have the old man. We still have the flesh, and that flesh is going to do what's wrong. And that's where we get, it's, it's our sin nature where we're going to commit sin. Not only that, Jesus says this, or sorry, the Bible says in 1 John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Proving again to the, these delusional people that think they've never sinned that Jesus died not just for our sins only, talking about the saved, but he died for the sins of the whole world. He died for everyone's sins, and that's because everyone has sin, and that's why Jesus died for them. Now, it says in Romans 3, 21 and you know 23 is the verse we always use but in Romans 3 21 it says but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest being witnessed by the law and the prophets even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ upon all and unto all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference the Bible says for all meaning every single one of us has sin or have sin and, and come short of the glory of God every single one of us has sinned against God before in our lives and people just for some reason I guess because they're delusional they don't want to understand this and they don't want to acknowledge that they're a sinner now I've had you turn to Romans chapter number five which says the same thing Romans five twelve. if you look down at Romans five twelve, the Bible reads and says Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So the Bible's clear even in this verse that death passed upon all men. Why is that? Because all have sinned. Every single one of us has sinned against God. And it says, For until the law of sin was in the world, but it was not, but is not impu but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Just talked about Adam uh, bringing in sin, in the sense bringing in dis disobedient in disobedience into the world, and then that's caused other people to be disobedient to God. That's what brought sin into the world, and then. These people had their own sins, they're punished for their sins, and Adam was punished for his, and that's what it says that they're not even, they're not punished, sorry, it says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, meaning that these people already had their own sins, and they weren't punished for Adam's sin, because there's a teaching called original sin, and that's another sermon in and of itself, but these people are not being punished for Adam's transgression they're being punished for their own now go with me to first john chapter number one. First john chapter number one because this verse or these few verses i think they're the the nail in the coffin just to for anyone think who thinks that they're not they're not a sinner or they're they've reached the state of sinless perfection because i think these verses are really clear from the bible and at this point if someone sees a verse like this you tell a person a verse like this they don't want to believe it then that person's clearly delusional that you know that they're they've reached the state of sinless perfection now in first john chapter number one verse six the bible reads and it says if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanses us from all sin now the bible says in verse eight 
If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So someone who says, I have no sin, I've reached a sinless a state of sinless perfection. You know what that person's ultimately doing? First of all, they're delusional, but what they're doing is that they're deceiving themselves and the truth is not in them. God's word's not in that type of person who thinks that they've never sinned. Because like I said earlier on in the sermon, if you can't acknowledge that, you're a sin, that you have sin, then you have no need for a Savior. And there, there would be no f- point of Jesus dying for it if you can't say that, hey, I'm a sinner. And that's why that's the first point we try to make when we're out preaching. Because if you can't get past that first point, then the person's just pretty much doomed. Because if you can't acknowledge you're a sinner, then there's no need for a Savior. It says in verse 9, if we confess our, our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It says in verse 10, for the people who say, well, I've never sinned before. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word's not in us. So someone who says that, oh, I've never sinned before. You know, I've never lied. I've never stolen. I've never done anything wrong. I've, I, I'm pretty much almost perfect. You know, that person is a liar. So you can always turn to this verse and say, well, and I've done this to many people who say, oh, I've never sinned before. If they, like I said, if they have any, just a small part of them actually believes the Bible, they would have to acknowledge that if someone says that we have not sinned, meaning even themselves, they make God a liar and his words not in us. You know, they're not preaching what the Bible says. Now, that's my second point is that, and or back to my first point, it's just that people who believe that you have to be good to get to heaven or that they're a good person, they're delusional. They don't believe the, what the Bible says with all the facts that are around. Not only that, people who believe that they're, they've reached a state of sinless perfection or that they've never sinned before, those people are delusional because the Bible's clear. And even nature tells you you're going to do something wrong in life. So, you know, these people are delusional. Now, the third point, my last point is this, is that people who think that all Bible versions are the same are delusional. Now, the reason I bring that up is that I found an article online. I'll read that in a few minutes. And I was just like, come on. (laughs) That's just how I felt about it. And once I get into the story, you'll probably laugh because it's kind of a weird story of how I found the article. But people who believe that all Bibles are the same are delusional. Because you'll often hear people say, well, I read out of all these different Bibles because they say the same thing. Well, they don't say the same thing. These Bibles say different things. That's why we, at this church, we use the King James Bible. It's not it's because we don't believe they all say the same thing. We believe the King James has everything right, and all the other Bible versions are wrong. Now, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter number 30, verse 5, it says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Now, from my understanding, and I hear this number all the time, but they say there's over 400 Bible versions out there, and there probably is. I don't know, but I know there's a lot. I mean, just a lot in the English language. So you're not going to have, if you're going to have 400 of something that you're trying to make money off of, then they're not all going to say the same thing. So... The thing is, having over 400 Bible versions, they're all, they, all of them say, uh, most, I would say most of them, some of the false ones agree with one another, but most of them say conflicting things because they're all supposed to be different. Now, God has a stern warning about people adding or removing things from his word. The Bible says in De- Deuteronomy 4.2, it says, Ye shall not add unto the word which I commanded you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. And then the famous verse is Revelation 18 and, uh, 22, verse 18 and 19, where it says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the book of this prophecy, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So God has a stern warning about people tampering with his word. And I've heard people make the argument, well, he's only talking about revelation. Well, so you can pretty much change everything else in the Bible, but just don't tamper with revelation. That makes no sense. Like, for instance, Thomas Jefferson, he had a thing called the Jefferson Bible. And what Thomas Jefferson ended up doing, because Thomas Jefferson is burning in hell right now. I'm not even going to say more than likely. He, I'm 100% sure he's in hell. And the reason why is because Thomas Jefferson made his own Bible called the Jefferson Bible. And from my understanding, what he did was all the miracles that Jesus did, he took it out. I think he totally took out the book of Revelation. So do you think someone who's taking all the, let's just use 
all the stuff they took out in the Gospels alone. He took out literally every miracle that's there. So someone that's taking out all the miracles of God, you know, that Jesus did when he was on this earth, is someone who really loves the Bible? No, it's, you know, it's someone who obviously hates the Bible. And you're saying, well, that, this, this verse, Revelation 22, 18 and 19, doesn't apply to a person like that. Someone who's really, you know, taking a, lot, a big chunk out of the Bible, I would say this totally applies to them. And that person would be in hell just like anyone else who tampers with Revelation or Genesis, or whatever verse you want to talk about. You know, anyone who tampers with God's word, the Bible says God's going to add the plagues that are written in the book of Revelation. All those things that you read about where, you know, people are drinking or sorry, I'm trying to think of all the plagues. There are a lot of them. <laughs> but, uh, man, I need some help with some of these plagues. What's one? Oh, the locusts. There we go. Yeah, the locusts coming out of hell and stinging people. You know, that's something you probably don't want to want to be around you know during that time but not only that he says you're going straight to hell too so you're gonna you know if you're alive during those times where god's pouring his wrath on this earth you're gonna get god's wrath poured on you and then on top of that you go straight to hell so it's like you know i'll leave that alone i wouldn't you know go around and start messing with the bible now what i want you to do is go with me to proverbs chapter number 25 proverbs 25 because like I said, there was an article I found on, on the internet, and I thought it was just funny <laughs> to a certain extent. I was just like, come on, you know. People think, I don't know if j just, this is the easiest way to put it. It's just that if you ever hear someone make an outlandish claim from the Bible, then it more than likely came from a false Bible version. That's the easiest way to put it. So the story goes as this, is that back in like, I think July, it was National Ice Cream Day. And I was trying to find some free ice cream, and unfortunately, I could not find any. So I kept reading articles to see where the free ice cream was going to be. I couldn't find where the free ice cream was, but I did find an article that mentioned the Bible. And I'm going to read part of the article to you just so you can see more or less the foolishness of people who have false Bible versions or who read false Bible versions. So it's, this is a CNN article called National Ice Cream Day, Fun Facts About Everyone's Favorite Frozen Treat. And it says this, ice cream, you scream, well, you know the rest. Americans will have an excuse Sunday, and it, this was during, between services on a Sunday when I was reading this article, because I was trying to find some ice cream, but it says to dig into their favorite flavors as the country celebrates National Ice Cream Day. We've got the scoop on all your biggest questions. Where did ice cream come from? So it says this, w our love for ice cream goes way, way back. Thousands of years ago, people around the world figured out that cold plus sweet equals a delicious combo. Records show that, the, that some of history's most famous leaders enjoyed cold treats, from Emperor Nero to Alexander the Great. Even King Solomon was fond of a snow-cooled drink at harvest time, according to some Bible translations. So according to this article, it's saying that King Solomon loved ice cream. King Solomon was one of the people who actually was you know, the progenitors of the ice cream we know today. And they're saying this actually is found in the Bible. So let's see what verse they're taking out of context to prove that Solomon, you know, had ice cream. So this is the verse that they're using, and it was quoted in the article. It's Proverbs chapter number 25, verse 13. It says this, as the snow, as the cold of snow in the harvest Sorry, in the, as the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that send him, for he refresheth the soul of his masters. So, does anyone see where that verse mentions ice cream? Because I don't. <laughs> I don't see that mentioning ice cream at all. But, obviously, that's what I was saying earlier, that people who believe or who read these false Bible versions, or whenever you hear someone, like I said, make an outlandish claim from the Bible, and say, well, the Bible talks about ice cream, or the Bible talks about the slimy juice of the marshmallow, if you, anyone's familiar with that. You know, it comes from a false Bible version 99% of the time, because I don't see that in that verse where it's saying, as the snow, as the cold of snow in the time of harvest. You know, what this is talking about is just right before you harvest, the weather gets cooler, and, you know, you can have, say, if it's a place where there is snow, it gets cooler in the area, so it's refreshing when you're harvesting not doing out in the sun. So is a faithful messenger to them that send him for he re refreshes the soul of his master. So you send someone out then, and you know, he comes back or whatever, then he refreshes your soul and you get to see him again. 
It's not saying anything about ice cream in this verse. Well, it comes from the NIV. So that's where your culprit is, is that it's in the NIV. And the NIV says this, Like a snow-cooled drink at harvest time is a a trustworthy messenger to the one who sends him. He refreshes the spirit of his master. So it's saying like a snow-cooled drink at harvest time. So that's what it's talking about with ice cream. It comes from the NIV, and I think a few other Bible versions say that. But that's not what the King James is saying in, in this. And you can see that if someone's sitting there saying there's obviously a bunch of contradictions with the King James, like in the sense of, with false Bible verse, I'm not saying the King James has contradictions, so don't, you know, don't take out the clip if this ever goes online and say, Caleb's saying that the King James has con- contradictions, because I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the false Bible versions contradict the Bible, like the King James Bible, and people still are delusional to think that, well, they say the same thing. We can see in this verse that they're not saying the same thing. And I oftentimes, because if someone's using a false Bible version, I don't really go through the history of it. I don't, because I, I know some of the history, but it can be really long just to explain what's going on and how the Bible is created. I just open the Bible and say, hey, let me see your Bible. I show them in the King James where their Bible contradicts the King James. A lot of the time, they just jump on board. I had a friend that I ended up getting saved at a job I worked at, and he was really trying to grow in the Lord. But he was going to a liberal church. He was using the NIV. So then I sat him down one day, and I said, hey, you're using a false Bible. And I just opened the Bible, and for about an hour, I was just showing all the contradictions that the false Bible versions had with the King James. And the guy threw out that Bible, and then I think we actually had a Bible burning, you know, after I was done talking to him, just because he saw that, yeah, this stuff didn't make any sense. And it's totally different than even just what you grow, grow up with from what the Bible says. So... All that to say this is that people who think that all the Bible versions are the same, and if you need more info on that, I think there's probably some New World Order Bible versions in the back shelf. If not, just read the King James regardless. But, you know, we can see that people who believe that or who believe that the, you know, all Bibles say the same thing, they're delusional because they don't say the same thing. If you just pick up one and pick up the other and read them together, then they're going to say two different things. And I've heard even pastors say that. Well, I read both. No, you don't. <laughs> it's like they preach out the NIV, but they're saying they read both. It's like, no, you don't. Because if you read, if you had them side by side during your Bible study, you're going to say these two things do not say the same thing. Even just a normal layman in church. I've done it before where I'll look at a chapter. And I'm just like, you know, I'll compare the King James to something else. I'm like, these two things don't say the same thing. So anyone knows that. And people who think that are delusional. So just all that to say this, especially pastors who sit there and say that they're all the same when they're not, because they should know the facts about it. If you're going to get up and preach and have a congregation, then you should go and study things, study to show yourself approved. But anyway, you know, if you have the facts about something, or someone gives you facts about something, and then you just don't want to believe it, then you're delusional. And we've seen that from three different examples I gave today, that people who believe in a work salvation or believe that they're a good person, thinking that their good deeds are going to get them to heaven, they're delusional. People believe that they've reached a state of sinless perfection are delusional. People who use the NIV and think, oh, there's no difference between the NIV and the King James. They just change the these and the thous and the yees and the yous and all that. They're delusional because none of these things say, you know, the, the Bibles don't say the same thing. That's why we should use the King James Bible. Now, all that to say this is that we shouldn't be delusional people. We shouldn't be people that if someone shows us enough facts about things, and obviously compelling, compelling evidence. It's not like some flat earther starts showing you verses that sound like flat earth and you're just not learned. So you just like start getting caught up in that, and, and it's already been preached against many times. I'm talking about someone shows you compelling evidence of something that's true and that's something that makes sense, then if it's, if, it's, if it's good enough that you can say, yeah, it makes sense, I understand where this is coming from, the Bible says it in many different places, then maybe you should either jump on board or become delusional, you know, be someone who just wants to fight the facts. And we shouldn't be people like that. You know, we should be people that if someone, you know, if maybe we hear something from the pulpit, especially like as a new believer, you know, I, I'll say that. I remember getting into church, or sort of getting into church, listening to pastor for the first few times, and there are a lot of things that I believe that conflicted with what he was preaching from the pulpit, but he laid down the facts, he laid down what the Bible said, and the good thing about it is I listened, and then I accepted that. 
But, but the person who doesn't do that, a lot of the time, they're delusional if they want to believe whatever they believed before, and they have all the facts to back it up. So, like I said, we don't want to be people like that. And, you know, just another thing to say is that that's a lot of, I've heard a lot of people say that about pastors, like pastor would preach something. But let's just use the preacher of rapture, where someone believed the preacher of rapture before, and then they watch, you know, the Revelation series, they watch after the tribulation, they listen to his sermons. A lot of the time, they don't go back to the preacher of rapture unless they're just delusional because he's laid all the facts. And I've heard many people say that. So we need to be people who are, you know, if we have facts like that, you know, like if you still believe the preacher of rapture for some reason in this church, which I doubt anyone does. But let's just say you do. There's a lot of facts to back that up. And don't be delusional to not believe things that, you know, that are clearly laid out in the Bible. There's obviously things that... Some of us, you know, there are things I don't understand in the Bible, and there's things that are, that's not, you know, it's more or less someone's opinion that's not really clear, but the clear statements of the Bible, the clear things that we find in the Bible, you know, if, like I said, if there's enough evidence to prove it, if it makes sense, then, I mean, there's no harm in believing it as long as it's true. So let's not be delusional people. Let's be people who, you know, read our Bible, serve God, and, you know, if we do run into delusional people, don't get too mad at them, you know. They forgive them for they know what, not what they do. Let's pray. Lord.